Thank you, Wayne. It is my honor to introduce to you tonight Dr. Marta Terry Gonzalez. I feel grateful to the Miller Committee and to the eight other units that funded her journey here, which was a journey across obstacles that are still in place after almost 60 years. All of us thank you, Marta, and thank you, the audience, for coming. First, my own unit, the Graduate School of Library and Information Science, but also the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies, the Departments of African American Studies, Anthropology, Gender and Women's Studies, History, and Latina Latino Studies, and the University Library and its Mortensen Center for International Library Programs. Marta Terry was raised in a multi-generational household of 23 people, led by her grandmother, Higinia. The household included her great-grandmother, for whom she was named. That first Marta was a freed slave, probably born in Africa. Out of this household in the 1950s came five talented young adults. Marta herself was a fully engaged member of her generation at the University of Havana during 1948 to 1952. She and her brother Hector were soon part of the response to the brutality of Fulgencio Batista, one of many Latin American dictators who were kept in place by the United States government during the 20th century. Marta became a librarian as, and was, was among the first so trained in Havana. She did an internship in Washington, D.C., ironically in the library of the Organization of American States that was later to shut revolutionary Cuba out. But with the revolution coming to power, she also finally found work, again at the center of the action, directing in particular three crucial libraries. For six years, she built and directed the library at Huseplan, the central planning board of the economy at that time. That, in fact, was, when she was where she first encountered Che Guevara, who led that board, and when she was first involved in debates and activity around that new machine called a computer. For 20 years, she directed the library at Casa de las Americas, where she helped make possible Latin America's cultural and literary explosion, the prodigious outpouring that was itself a response to the repression across the region. And for 10 years, she directed the Jose Marti National Library of Cuba. There, she brought an institution conceived in 1901 into step with modern Cuba. Most notably, she kept the library open, she kept the staff employed and patrons using the materials through the collapse of the Soviet Union, when Cuba's economy temporarily went into shock. For 30 years, Marta was part of international library conferences and projects. Many US librarians, including several from the University of Illinois and several who are here in this room tonight, helped her as, the, as she was the point person defending Cuba against one of the US State Department's many secret campaigns that have later come to light this one being, being aimed particularly at libraries. Ultimately, she was named the first person from the Global South to be named Honorary Fellow of the International Federation of Library Associations, and that was 80 years into the life of that organization. Speaking with Marta tonight is my husband and co-author, Abdul al Kalaman. He and I co-authored a biography of Marta Terry, Roots and Flowers, the Life and Work of Afro-Cuban Librarian Marta Terry Gonzalez. The book was published this year and is available at the Illini Union Bookstore, on Amazon, or from us authors. Abdul is Professor Emeritus from the University of Illinois Department of African American Studies, as well as the Graduate School of Library and Information Science. Please join me in welcoming Abdul al Kalamat and especially Dr. Marta Terry Gonzalez. Again, thank you for coming. I uh, want to express uh, a great deal of uh, honor and privilege to have had this relationship with uh, Marta Terry and had the opportunity uh, to co-author this uh, book. Uh, she was very gracious in sharing her life with us and uh, we're pleased to be able to continue that by sharing it with you. Uh, <clears throat> we, we titled the book Roots and Flowers uh, because uh, Marta's life is really rooted in the history of Cuba, and uh, those are the roots and the wonderful accomplishments of the uh, library experience are the flowers, uh, so roots and flowers. And so now the roots, 
Marco, you are a librarian. So let's start our discussion with your background. How did you become a librarian? Well, I really don't know. It's just because perhaps I was born as in nowhere until in in a tiny in a tiny room with that was a school in in I mean at home they had a school and they say do you know how aunts and, and grandparents are they say that it was that wonderful day that they couldn't say at what age I started to read. If I follow their, their thought, I could say that I started to read at one because they were so much proud of myself. But the story about this is that during my whole life, one, two, three, four, up to now, I have been just surrounded by books and books and books. And when I don't have books around me, I feel just like that. That's beautiful. That's poetry and literacy. But I also had to study. It was a duty, an obligation from my family. But he said, Ruth, you had to be, you had to have a university graduate. Nothing less. They are strong. Because I wanted to study something at any one and they they say, no, that's something was medicine. So, I don't know, I'm not going to repeat what is in there. Finally, I started to study, and finally I, I studied um, philosophy and letters. It's a beautiful career, the most beautiful career over the world, but my dear, the useless of all. <laughs> because they are. At those time, we didn't have a, a place where to, to work. And at the same time, there was lots of movement, parallel movement, where we are going on in my country. And, and among those parallel movements, there was one movement within the faculty of philosophy and letters for some people trying to have a librarian career, a librarian professor. So I had I had studied my philosophy and letters. I was it was a wonderful thing, and well, that is very important. I have been I, I have asked for scholarship for the United States to, to come to study to the United States. I had to wait one year. You know, for all those things you know about scholarship, if yes or not, and, and, and those things. So I had nothing to do, uh, nothing to, to live with, of course. And then some of my professors advised, while you are waiting for, to continue your studies at the United States, why don't you study librarianship? And, uh, and, uh, uh, and I thought it was a very good idea. Because before that, we had made some kind of volunteer work trying to, to make a tiny library in philosophy and letters. So with all of these, I don't know whether you understand what I mean, but, but with all of these, I became a librarian. And I don't know how, that's, that's what I cannot say. I don't know how. Philosophy and letters withdrew in my interest and in, in my looking for a life. It disappeared. And I started thinking and working with librarianship. So that year, I came to the United States to study there at Newport in New York, where what I did was to look for space as a, I don't know, as a trainee at the Pan American Union Library. So you see, I forgot all about the, the philosophy, the letters, and everything. So, and that became a librarian. So, I don't know whether 
It is a good explanation, but perhaps just a miracle. Just I don't know. Well, it's clear that uh, libraries are at the center of any discussion of information. Uh, sometimes we forget that uh, and we assume that that libraries are fundamental to the uh, creation, preservation, mm -hmm. and distribution of information. Mm -hmm. So we know that Cuba made world history in 1961 mm -hmm. with its literacy campaign mm -hmm. in which thousands of people, even very young people, mm -hmm. teenagers, mm -hmm. left school to educate people even in the most remote areas. Mm -hmm. Cuba ended up being the most literate country in mm -hmm. all of Latin America, for mm -hmm. sure. Mm -hmm. What impact did the literacy campaign have on Cuban libraries? Well, <clears throat> I have been asked that question in, in different times. But I think, I don't know, at this moment, I feel that it's not impacting library. The literacy campaign had a tremendous impact in the whole Cuban life. It was the first movement, real movement, real mass movement, to change things. Because the first thing you had to do is you being able to read, to being to be able to understand, and to look for more information, and to be just a human being, a civilized human human being. And I think that was what happened. Of course, we had uh, this vast movement. Children, teenagers, going everywhere on the country. Mountains, rivers, whatever. You can make a, a verse. Well, there are some verses and poetry about that. Everywhere. But at the same time, you had to develop, you had to take care of those children. So you had to look for some uh, medical care. There were the, the students of, of medicine, because we didn't have so many doctors as, as we have now. So the students they had to go to support and help the people there in, 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 in the country. Well. Then they had a, this, this people, the, the children, they had a lot of goodwill, but they didn't know how to, to teach. So you have to develop some people with some, some kind of knowledge to help them to approach people and, and to teach people. So you see, from one place to another, from one phenomenon to another one and to, the whole country was just something like growing departing from the literacy campaign and fidel has been famous for the slogan mm. uh, don't believe read yes yes and uh, that was one of the reasons for the literacy campaign and for the foundation of the Cuban Book Institute. And for having all of us just working like mad to see how to convince people, not to convince, to show people that there were places where they could go and find books, and they didn't have to, to pay, not because in Cuba you don't have to, to, to pay to, to go to, to, to a library and to have the, the, I mean, the car, no, nothing like that. So that was one of the things. And I remember that we said to people, do not believe, just read. And of course, you can take it and think about this, this phrase, and it's really very deep in content. 
because it means that not even his word, that for a while was the word. And I'm not going to deny that was like that. For instance, we had something like this. Something happened. Anything. Well, let's wait until Fidel speaks. But it was vanishing and vanishing as the editorial, the publishing industry was growing and growing, and, and the education, the whole education system was growing and growing. And you had to read. You couldn't, you, you couldn't say, oh, well, I don't have money to buy the books. I don't, have, I don't find a place where getting the book, you, you start to, you have the places, the libraries. Well, we talk about libraries later. But you had the schools, and when you, you registered schools, first grade, second, third, fourth, you were given, no, you were not, you are given your books, your copy books, even your pencil. So there was no reason for not reading, for not inquiring, for not investigating that all weapons in there. So what you had to do was to use it. I don't know whether it is what you wanted. Now, we know that information is a function of the medium. What has been the role of newspapers, radio, and TV? We also know that your nephew is the editor of the major daily newspaper in Cuba uh, named Granma, mm -hmm. after the boat that Fidel and others landed with the wave of revolutionaries in 1956. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it's clear that in a democratic society, mm -hmm. the role of mass media is, is critical in, in educating the public about events and policies. Mm -hmm. How does this happen in Cuba? Well, there, you said, democratic society. So I, I could ask them that we are a super democratic society because sometimes it's too much. <laughs> yes, for instance, that's just kidding because you are there, you're not going to be boring. Well, for instance, we have four channels, TV channels. One Channel is the channel for the family. Everything, just yeah, miscellaneous. Then channel for sports, very important sports. And then two other channels. Channel, uh, how you how do they call it? Channel one, education channel one, and education channel two. Both education channel, I just forgot. And for instance, the first thing we, we did was the, how you call it, university for all. You see the same idea, always the same idea, illiteracy, and, uh, and then the, the different degrees and people going, and now, as, as not everybody can go to university where you put them into it. In, in, the, in TV, and it has, it has become really something very important because they have developed um, some programs where in a, just a, in, in, in a way that is uh, agreeable, very well done, not as a picture, but you know, a way between documentary, films, say like that, all kind of subjects. For instance, in, at this very moment, they, have, uh, they are having a course about Asia and what is going on in, in Asia. But they are not telling the story of what is going on. It's not a newspaper news. It's just 
to see the background, the history, everything from Nefertiti, from everybody, all those. And this course has been given, is being given by two really wonderful professors from the university. It, it is headed not, not to, to see the, but to, to any kind of population. At the same time, we have decided that it's about time everybody in Cuba must speak English. Don't you think so? Well, so we are having, a, on this very moment, a course in English. Of course, we have had it in Italian, we have had it in French also, but they were in this very moment, they have been decided that all university graduates must prove proficiency in English. That's from now on. But more than that, well, they put it in uh, university for all. Okay. What, that's one of the channels. Also, there are some schools that are very far away from the cities. And for instance, they have, um, let's say, 20 or 30 students in a very far retired uh, place. And it's just one professor, or at least two professors. So they, I should say, we, 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 um, how do you, we firm, in another way, I mean, we firm the classes, we give classes, and they tape them and so on, and those classes help the professors for their classes in, in, this, uh, in these circumstances. And also, I have never remembered that, not even for a period. I've been the star of reference classes because I was reference professor. So I had to, to put my classes to be filmed and to help people from the evening courses. Because we have a, a regular courses, what we call well, and evening courses for university people. So for, for help, sometimes we don't have the, the, the real professor we do need. So the senior ones must, must do this film and so on. So that's for TV. Mm. In radio, just the same. And in the in newspapers, you know, you have it here quite a collection of Cuban papers. You have it. I have seen it. It's very, very good and it's very well protected. And we have always used newspapers to help, to clarify. Now that I am retired, or supposedly to be retired, one, <laughs> one of my entertainment is shows open grandma. And they have a column, page two, where they show what's going on over the world in science, in technicalities, in, in technology and so on. For instance, I learned with them that about uh, old age, you know, we have a lot of old people in Cuba, too many, I think. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, and they say, well, I, I found a new where it was a report from some laboratories and some research, investigation research and so on, that if you pass your 60s and you don't get Alzheimer's or, or those, or those uh, sickness, 
you remain, your brain remain as if you were 40. So you can go on and be 40. Well, that was the news. Now my advice, do not believe that too much because your brain might be 40, but the rest of the world is not so much. So just my mind. But what I mean, you are very seriously, is that just that part of the of, of grandma gives you knowledge about lots of things that you cannot believe. You wouldn't go to any library to, to ask for 40, 40 years or what's up or something like that. That's for one thing. And then they have a lot of new of, of new, not new, young journalists, very young journalists. Oh, they are becoming because they protest, they show, they teach. You know, young people always know much more than old people, that's for sure. <laughs> so, yeah, so, you see. Well, I don't know whether I, I, I answer your, your question. Now, information is also a cultural question. Yeah. Now, you were librarian for 20 years at Casa de las Américas, mm -hmm. the premier cultural institution in Cuba that connected with all of the mm -hmm. hemispheres, mm -hmm. the artists, the writers, the mm -hmm. musicians, the intellectuals. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about what happened at Casa while you were head of the library in terms of information flow in the cultural world throughout the hemisphere. Well. It could be a very long story because it would be a 20 year story. I'm not going to, don't, don't be afraid. But <clears throat> Casa de las Americas, as just as you know, was a very avant garde uh, institution in cultural field. Casa de las Americas and the Institute for the Film. Even the, both directors, Aide and Alfredo, Alfredo Guevara, they were very good friends. And they were just working to look for the best of the best in world culture and in Latin American culture. So they started by having departments. One department for music development, let's say that. Like that. They didn't call it like that, but what that was real. Music Latin American music development and research. Latin American literature development and research. How you say art, art and the same. So you had what the arts, music, literature, and how well are you going to work? We knew that somebody there was a very good poet, and somebody there in Uruguay was a very good poet. That was Mario Benedetti. But he was the only good poet in Uruguay. And in Paraguay, or in Brazil, or so, I did not know what we had to do at that library was to become an information center for Latin American culture. And it has been really a tremendous work, a tremendous job. They are still working on that. And uh, we had made known, or Cuba to be known, really not in those countries, but also we have heard those countries, those artists, those, because artists are at the long culture and history to be known in Cuba. So, for instance, when that uh, thing about Allende, 
in Chile, where you can imagine it was terrible. We were so much in a sort of but there was a second thing for all Cubans. Victor Jara. Victor Jara was uh, a singer, more or less of the inheritance of the protest son that was born in the United States. Protest son were born in the United States. And then we acquired them, we, we learned about protest son and it, be, it became quite a, quite a movement in Latin America. And in Cuba, it's what we call Nueva Droga. I cannot explain it that way. New people singing old things. Well, when Victor Jara was taken by this Pinochet and so on and was killed, it was a national so in Cuba, nobody had to say so, but just because he had, he had come to Casa de las Américas, he had gone into television, he had those wonderful songs, so he became something like ours. He was like ours. I'm telling this, Victor Jara, but I, I could say a lot of other people, but this is the, the most uh, important example. So, the same with many, many, really many uh, novelists, poets, essays in Latin, Latin America. But we are just in there having more or less the same problem we, we were having in Cuba. Before a revolution, there were poets, novelists, and so on, but they didn't have the facilities, the ways to publish their, their works. So we started publishing our works, and at the same time, we started publishing some people, some outstanding, uh, or not so much outstanding. They became outstanding after all. Uh, people think, from Latin America. I don't know where this is about, but you want to. In this country, there is something known as the Monroe Doctrine, where the government and the corporations claim hegemony over all of Latin America and the Caribbean, but the contradiction is that uh, those of us who live in this country have very little knowledge about Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, we also know that uh, there is a blockade uh, that our government has used to squeeze Cuba. And we also know that Cuba lost its support from the Soviet Union uh, when uh, Russia moved from socialism mm -hmm. back to ca uh, capitalism. Mm -hmm. And that created a special period mm -hmm. uh, of crisis, of economic crisis. Mm -hmm. The blockade and then the absence of the subsidy from the mm -hmm. Soviet Union. How have the Cuban librarians survive these global betrayals? Survive. Just the same, it is just the same as the Cuban people. By resisting, resisting, and resisting. Okay. And then looking for ways to go out, to go around that tremendous stroke that was to be just like that. Let me see if I can translate something that a very important person said about that. It was the Minister of Education of Heart. He said, we have been left hanging from a brush. Can you imagine that? I don't know whether the translation is good enough. But it means you are you are painting a wall, and then there is hierarchy, and then you are just hanging from the brush. So, and what that was the feeling we had. It's a feeling of loneliness, 
of being just by yourself and not knowing what to do and how to do it. But there was one thing we did know. We had to survive. And we were not going to lose what we have gained. So the first thing was resist. Resist and resist and wait and, and try to look for ways to go. But then we, we understand, we understood, excuse my English. We understood. Very good. <laughs> we understood that from now on, or from those moments on, we had the only help we had was ourselves. And we have to depend on what we were able to do, good or bad, more or less. But we have to be, we have to do our own, and we have to be our own, and we have to invent, and we have to do whatever. For instance, that word invention has become something in very, very, very popular in, in, in Cuba, in, in Cuban just everyday talk. For instance, this is for, for ladies. Because it is supposed that, later that men and women, we are just the same and so on, but the cook are the women. So for women, we are working now, about five, we have to go now home. Well, let me see, why do I invent today? You know how it means? What do I cook? What do I do to feed my people? my invention. Now, it was about the special period. Now, <laughs> I have a friend that said, he calls me, how are you? Well, no, 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 no. well, how are you? Where are you? I am in the laboratory. You know what is laboratory? <laughs> the kitchen. The bread when you do it. You make, you invent, big but, but, you always have something to eat. We have been in the verge or not. But all these things, and I'm just talking like that, but it has been very, it has been very hard. But it has hardened us to, just the same, the older, the early, the, the teenagers, and, and the children. We often hear that uh, Cubans are not part of a global transformation based on computers and the internet. This new technology revolution has taken the world by storm. Do you have a computer? And can you get on the internet? Yes, can I can. Can Cuban people use uh, computers and get on the internet? And how important have the support from the Venezuelans uh, been with its new help to connect Cuba uh, to the global internet? Because originally, the entire island had a T1 line. Mm -hmm. And now they're expanding the capacity. And I wonder if you could comment on those things. Well, let's see. When I was at the National Library, I was going to be the person who was going to work on the automation and so on. I have had uh, uh, some, some very good relations, friendly relations with the, with the Swedish and the, with the Scandinavian library and you know, they are very good. Not as good as you are, but well. <laughs> and uh, I managed to have some money and I had an engineer in my staff, you know that? An engineer in my staff, because we wanted to make all these all this new technologies and so on. And I sent this man to the Scandinavian countries to look, to store, to see, and so on. 
He was in there for one month. And when he came back, he said, we can do nothing. Because we need, I don't know the name, that a cable, a special uh, telephone cable. And if you don't have that special telephone cable that has to go on the way from the whole country, there's nothing you can do. You can have perhaps some kind of connection, but for the whole country, you cannot. Well, we started doing some things, I can, I can talk later on, but my, what my aspiration, my ambition, our, not mine, our, was to have, to connect the whole the public library system and so on. So time goes on, time goes on and on, and then Chavez comes to power in Venezuela. And, well, there were so many problems that he had to face, we had to face, Bolivia had to face, Ecuador had to say, we went together in the ALBA group, that was the first thing. And what was the most needed to see in Cuba? Communication. Being able to communicate from, from the internet. As a reference librarian, see, and as a reference professor, I have a lot of doubt. But as a librarian, it's not the same. As a librarian, I need to internet to work. Two different things that are the long run at the same. So, and you have said it in, in, in your question, the global and everybody. And it was decided that one of our first need in Cuba after oil, you know, oil is every for every is a problem everywhere, but well, after all, was communication internet. So they started to work on it. And they are working on it. Perhaps you know, well, I'm sure you know. I, 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 know, I know that something had to go uh, through the, I mean, under the sea, you know, I had to go there. Because, well, I never remember, you know, that the 40, the 40 years old thing. I had not remembered that Cuba, there is a, you take the Cuban map and you see that all lines coming from the state go around the island, go around the island, but do not enter into the island. So, all you had to do just to make those lines, not the one, but our own line to, 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 to enter the island. They are working on it. It's very difficult because of resources, because of, you know, so many things. But we are working on it. And sooner or later, much sooner than later, we are going to have a, the internet. I mean, full internet. Full internet. For instance, I, I, I cannot go to YouTube. I cannot enter YouTube. Why? Because the connection is, is very narrow. We cannot. And when you, my dear friends, you send those PDF, my God. <laughs> and I have to discuss that. It's very, it's very difficult. The people who are more, who have been luckier have been, of course, of course, the people from the medical centers. Because if one, if we have one cent, that one cent goes for the medical information. 
So they, ha they are a little better, you know, they are a little better, but they don't have the divine any anywhere. So that's it. Just to uh, bring it down into the story hmm. uh, from the special period, tell the story of the one light bulb in the uh, National Library. Oh. That's in the book, by the way. That, <laughs> that story, even, the, I think they made a, a short film, something like that. You know? No, you don't, you don't know. You cannot know, and you cannot imagine what blockade is when work. It's, it's something like that. But, <laughs> uh, we had the National Library, and we have, uh, well, you know, you are stacks. We have a stack the same. No, no, not those ones who move, or no, 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 not for us. But, well, that's your first stack. And we have the books in stacks. And we must have lights, lights in the, in the ceiling. But one verb go down, was going out of, out of work, and another one, and another one, and another one, and then we were left one light bulb. For the whole 14 stories of the National Library. Oh dear. What to do? I was the director, you know. I was just looking for, con for some some ways, but the people, the, the librarians, the employees, you call them as you want to. You know what they invented? They had one board left. And so they have that board. The one who, is in the, who was in the chair, in, in, in the pocket or whatever. Well, we need yeah, let's say we need the Tennessee Williams novel, whatever. Eight thirteen. Eight thirteen must be or is at the third floor. There goes the girl. Yes, she put it, her board. Eight thirteen Williams. Dos pasos, whatever. With Williams. Then. She took out the door, she delivered the books to the user, and then another one. But, but now what I want are the words of Martí. Martí, Martí, Martí is 1981, 81, because, you know, complete words are 81, but go to the 81, to Martí, with the board. You put you to the, and then you took my D, and then you. I'm telling like this just like a, like a joke, but believe me, it was sometimes to burst in tears. It was in such a way that then some documentalists from, from the television, they went and film that all to have this thought of that. Now, finally, could you give us some idea of what you think the future will bring? We know the U.S. is changing its policy toward Cuba. But this is the end of Obama's period. We only have so many months left. Uh, and given that the blockade, uh, and the U.S. illegally holding on to Guantanamo, belligerently, I might add. What is the future that you see about information and everything else? The Pope has just been there. Uh, uh, Secretary uh, Kerry has just been there. Maybe Obama will be there. What do you think the future will bring to Cuba? The first thing is to refer to the Pope. He said, pray, 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 and then pray for me. Wasn't it like that in here when he came? 
So let us pray. But I'm not going. <laughs> I'm not going to, to, to make that joke. Listen, you said change of politics. How you said? No, no, I know the future. But when you introduce the equation, the U.S. is moving to change its policy to the. Future. That's it. Change its policy or change its methods. That is the one billion fifty dollars question. And that is what all Cubans, this little one, the older one, the assignment one, they don't know, are, are asking. But we are intelligent and we have to be and we have to understand because behind those words there might be a lot of problems, a lot of intentions. Perhaps he couldn't say anything else but that. We don't know. But what we know is that whatever the words and whatever the intention, it is good. It's just the same, and when your sister or brother or brother and your brother, you are mad with each other. I don't like him because he made, he took my toy, whatever it is. But you are brother, sister or brother. And at this long run, we are the same family. And the whole humanity, you are the same family. So, some family have some evil people, and some family has some good people. You never know. And that is the answer. You never know. What we know is that we have to be continuing resisting. And we are used to resist. It's nothing new for us to resist. Well, that's for one thing. And for Guantanamo. Oh, well, you know, <laughs> uh, perhaps you know that we have uh, one public library, good, bad, big, or no, but what public library in each municipality over the country. So in Guantanamo, that is in the music municipality, we have a, a library. So one, I had to 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 go, you know, in, we visit, we used to visit the libraries, wherever, wherever they were, we go all the time visiting and trying to help and see what they need and so on. And this, this library is in a place we call Cangrejeras. That is very, very quite near just the, the base. It's near the base and it's near the Cuban army. Where the Cuban army is, you have in there the, the American army in the base, you have in here the, the Cuban army. Why do I say so? Because we manage with the boys in there, the boys are well, the soldiers, you know, the Cuban soldiers. And they look for the way to make me go there to one of, I don't know how they call the places where they look and they have guard and so on. So I could see the base. So I think I am one of the very rare people who have been able to see the base. Well, just, just construction, people coming in. But there is, from the place where Cuban army is, and the place where American army is, let's say about, I know, I, I'm very bad about, about uh, size. Let's say about 
three or four blocks. Three or four blocks of plain, plain land. And those boys there, they were there for, from the military service, you know, just kids. You know, do not get mistaken because all of that is mine. And it is so hard. It is so hard to know you have a place in your country that you need to do that, that you cannot work on, on it because of that. And what do they do with that one ton of base? Perhaps it had some kind of, of uh, some use for them strategically, I don't know. But now there's nothing in there but people suffering. We, 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 the Cubans, didn't make that, uh, that discovery. It was discovered that there was lots of people there suffering and things like that. When you see those pictures are not taken by Cubans, because we cannot go in there to take people. So I think it is useless. And at this time, of the of technology of of terrible war technology you don't need to know what's going on in cuba you need to have a base in there where you cannot they cannot move from that place so i think the intelligence of american people And the feelings of the American people will help him because I think we have to help him, whatever, to look for the ways of tearing it out of our country. I think so. I don't know. Well, thank you very much. Join me in thanking Marta for her presentation. Now we have a few moments for questions. There is a microphone uh, there. If you would raise your hand, Marta has agreed to answer a few questions. Did you have your own printing presses? Did you have to smuggle books from other countries into Cuba during the blockade years? And uh, so, <clears throat> how did you get new books for your libraries? Help me with that. Because he's asking, because of the blockade, mm -hmm. how were you able to get books? Oh, they're sober. They're sober. And not, it's not only trouble because you don't have real you have book, the book, you don't have the book. But it's also trouble because it has been interpreted, I don't know whether you can say that word, like we are censors, that we don't like uh, to have this author or that author or that book or another book. And I always think. If you have five dollars, hope you have five dollars, five dollars, and you have to select, to choose what you are going to, how you are going to use that. But you are going to choose what you think is better, more universal, more needed, perhaps books for for uh, some subject at the university or at the school and so on. And you would like to have the whole uh, uh, world literature, but you cannot. It's just impossible. And it has been quite a problem. And it's very good your, your question 
because it has made me remind that one of these things we have made at Casa de las Americas and met at national level was exchange, was to, uh, we had, what was our way of acquisition? No one penny. Just we sent our books, and the University of Mexico sent their books, the, Mex the Library of Mexico sent their books from Paraguay, and the Library of Congress. That, of course, they were very much interested in having our, 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 our books, our our rocks. It's not that change we already know that you send uh, you send a list and I ha I have this and one no anything we needed everything and it really has been it it, it has been it is very difficult a process for us. What we have found out, well, some foreign books, some foreign authors that are very much uh, well known and so on, publish them. But it's not the same, you cannot publish everything. The thing published, that's it. So, another question? Hi, I used to run a before and after school program where I would teach little kids about various aspects of technology. And then in the spring, when I was almost done, I saw this great video called Desobediencia Tecnologica about how um, people in Cuba during the blockade, when they couldn't get new stuff, they would take the old, old machine apart and reuse the parts to fix old machines where parts had worn down or whatever because they couldn't get new ones. And the guy who was talking most of the time said that by doing this, they learn to sort of see through the machine, to look at the outside, and to figure out its purpose and how, in general at least, it must be constructed on the inside to do what it does. And I thought, that is what I want to be teaching the kids. The way he talked about it in the video, though, um, the shock of having the blockade up and having no new machines come in was definitely an integral part. So I, I wanted to ask you, because the first question that came to my mind was, is that sort of shock necessary for that kind of insight to become widespread? Like, does it have to be used to survive? Or can it be done without that shock? Is there another way to teach it? What do you, what do you think? Uh, he is uh, asking a question about, uh, I think in this country we would say reverse engineering. Mm. In other words, you look at something mm. because you can't get parts mm. from the drawer. Mm. You look at something and you figure out how it works. Mm -hmm. And maybe you want to repurpose it for another thing. Mm. But, and he's saying, is there a way to teach that information without the uh, shock of the blockade? Is that your question? Okay. It's difficult. I, I have been talking about inventing. And I use the term for just cooking. So we have been inventing anything. Buses, cars, uh, computers, and we try to, but really, that part, that aspect of technology, of machines, of all that software and, and hard, is very, very difficult for us to, to have. I don't know if I am answering your question. Mm -hmm. You want to repeat it? Another question? Yes. Um, first of all, thank you for your insights. Um, I have a short question. Um, so during your experiences um, in Cuba uh, as a librarian, 
Do you ever consider um, uh, reading books or have the, having the access um, to the library facilities a uh, privilege to certain group have, of people? Having access to? Um, having access to uh, the library, um, the books, um, the free information. Uh, do you do you have do you ha have you ever considered um, this as a privilege for a certain group of people? Because I, um, um, according to my knowledge from my classes, um, there are after the revolution, there are great pressure on um, the economy, the economy um, um, of of Cuba. Mm -hmm. So um, I think they will transform. The social structure, and thus um, the people who have the access to the, the libraries. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't. Um, I think it actually makes sense. So if people can get um, economic prosperity, for example, food or co sufficient clothes, they probably um, don't have the expectation to have the access to books. So do you consider? Having books to read um, is a privilege for a certain group of people. I didn't know you are asking about access. Marta, hmm. he's asking the question of uh, in the whole society, mm -hmm. uh, are libraries, because of the economic crisis and so on, are libraries equally accessible and open mm -hmm. to people from all walks of life? Mm -hmm. And I think that it would be interesting to tell the story of your first experience in becoming the director of the National Library. And then also, in addition to that, and I think people here might be interested in the controversy of the so-called independent libraries. So first, your experience that first day, that Saturday, could you uh, tell that story? Well, thank you very much, Anna. And I, I, well, I, I was asked to go to the National Library because I have been in, at Casa de las Americas and now I should be at National Library of San Francisco. And I went there, walking, and I found while I, I was getting there, was approaching a long line of people. Oh my, about, let's say, 100 people waiting to enter the National to the Library. Was, I mean, remember, it was a Saturday morning. And then I was just going by my walking. And then I see how you call those patrol. Those police cars, you see, those they are putting order in the line. Oh my God. What? Somebody's crazy. They are crazy, or am I crazy, or something is going on very wrong. <laughs> so I went there. I entered. Not even the the employees that were, you know, taking care of the of, of the entrance. They didn't know me because I was just there. So I said, everybody out. Those policemen out. Those cars out. I don't want anybody here anymore. Ne never more. Cannot be. No. Then I asked the the, the employees. It's just because they have no help. It is your duty to let people enter and to take care that people behave themselves. Even they, they were not misbehaving anyhow. So that was it. That was what you wanted me to say. Well, that was like that. And about or around all this, 
uh, I have been talking about. I, I, I have, I, I hope I have not been dramatic about blockade because it can be a drama. It is a drama. I can tell you scenes of drama. Let's take it easy and have a good afternoon with all together here. And because of that, as I was telling, there were many, many instances in which when we could not get the book. You know, well, I'm glad that this is something we don't know, probably we should know. For instance, we were, um, when, when we started librarianship, we started, of course, doing a ALA rules for authors and, and so on. And I had to, you know, that doing each other two years, something like that, they made a, a revision and they put 338 there and then now only 334, something like that. And I, I look for some funding to buy the 17th edition. And well, we made, you know, the letter and so on. And what was the answer we got back? We are sorry, but we cannot send, we cannot sell, do it to you. You see, that's one, one sample you, all, all of us can understand. But the same with that, with many, many other things. Then what happened after that, or before that, was very good thing to accuse us of not buying this also, or that also, or not requiring that also, just ignoring, purposely, Ignoring that with two dollars you have to buy what is more in your line of thought, of course, of course. If I had to 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 share to to I mean to to select, I select my line of thought. Or sometimes I select the enemy's light line of thought. Because I have to do, I have to know what the enemy is is thinking and doing and preparing. But it's very, very difficult policy. You know, you are all the time like that. It's very, very difficult, really, and very easy to take it as as a, as a political issue. That was what happened with the independent library. It was just quite a, quite a thing because we didn't have in our library, or they say they, we didn't have in our library, 1984. And we have, a, and we have a very, very distinguished and honored people who was in their hands, who knows you know, everything that is Barbara. Barbara, you know, she was with us in that. It's, it's, it's terrible, and and the most terrible thing that you can do it to whatever you want to, because you are taking you, you are taking advantage of a disadvantaged position. You, what you can do? So it it, it has been hard. It has been hard. Did, did I answer your question? You excuse me because I cannot hear that. Okay. Unfortunately, uh, we've run out of time, but there is a reception that has been sponsored by Gislis, so everyone should uh, partake of the refreshments, and there will be additional opportunity to speak with Marta on a face-to-face -face basis. So again, Marta, thank you so much for sharing your information. Join me in welcoming.